activities at Oxford, which is developing the data catalogue for the university, which James uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned, briefly, uh, mentioned briefly in his talk a moment ago. And um, it uh, forms one part of this whole infrastructure, which, as James has already said, um, for is being developed by this cross uh, unit services uh, at the university. And Data Finder, as the data catalogue, has been um, quoted as being the sort of key part of the whole infrastructure, which is a fairly scary idea in many ways. Um, but the idea being that Data Finder acts as a sort of um, asset registry of the data outputs of the university. So basically we know what we've got and where it lives. And the point being that we need a location there for the data. The location might be um, a URL of the digital data that you can just click on and just go straight into. It might also equally be an address of somebody who you can contact to get access to that data if it's not open access. So the challenges that we're going to touch on in this uh, presentation, three of them. First of all, the metadata that we need to describe those data assets, which I know is being discussed at various institutions around the globe. How do we describe our different data, um, uh, data sets? Secondly, the user interface design that we're coming up with for Data Finder. And finally, the harvesting and interoperability and basically how Data Finder works. Now, the University of Oxford is a big place and it's cross-disciplinary, so we're having to look for a solution within Data Finder that covers a very wide variety of data sources. We've already heard about the different types of data that we might be dealing with, but coming from a wide variety of groups across the university, and also looking more outwardly at the data consumers who are going to consume the outputs of Data Finder, which includes both um, more researchers, but also administrators, and so on. So, picture of absolute perfection here. Is this what we're going to get? And the short answer is no. What we're looking for is a pragmatic solution that will do what we want well enough, because looking at every single aspect of Data Finder, there are compromises to be made, made at every step along the way. And so looking here at some of the aspects of data plan, first of all, the, uh, the best data that we're going to collect. First of all, we're looking at um, a set of mandatory metadata fields that we might collect. Now that's fine, and uh, by using a, a minimum core set of metadata, we can impose that on our on our manual depositors in Data Finder, but we can't always impose that on any harvested metadata because it's coming in from outside. In doing that, we're looking at context-specific metadata, mandatory fields. So, for example, <laughs> excuse me, we're looking at a, a mandatory core set which we can impose on everybody, but there again, if you've got somebody coming in with EPSRC funding, the EPSRC imposes its own restrictions on what your researchers are supposed to do with describing their metadata. And so we need to make sure that anybody coming in with EPSRC funding also puts in the fields and the information that's required by that funder. So our mandatory fields have to be tuned to the circumstances. We're using DataSight, the core DataSight, as our starting point and going on from there. DataSight provides a nice five basic fields that you need to cite your data. We're having to be discipline agnostic. Oxford covers a wide range of disciplines, as you've already seen, so we have to make sure that we're not going to sort of focus data finder in any one way. We have to be able to cope with any different discipline that comes in. As far as subject heading goes, we're looking at the FAST subject headings as a sort of basic level there for describing the subjects of our metadata, of our data assets. Again, later on, we're going to look at more discipline-specific subject headings. That's something, um, one of the things we can continue our work on. And looking at ease of metadata creation, um, academics do not like filling in forms, so we're having to make it as simple as possible for those records to be created so that the university has at least got a basic record of what it's got. 
And for any additional details for those nice rich metadata records that we might want, we're having to sort of basically go out and sell the benefits of Data Finder and all the other uh, services that we've got for academics to be persuaded that they might want to add some um, more detail. So, the, the minimum mandatory metadata, which should have a table on it, which seems to have disappeared, I don't quite know where that's gone, but uh, that's going to be freely available. Basically, it's 12 fields which um, comprise the, the data site uh, five fields, plus fields like location, fields like um, uh, the, a, a little abstract about the, the data, you know, what it is, so anybody coming in can assess the use of that data for themselves. Looking at the user interface design, we looked at the, the look and feel and branding of the, the interface, and we're trying to align it with other bodily and lively services. So it looks like we, we've got some joined up thinking across there. So for example, the institutional repository looks similar to our data bank and data finder, so researchers can see them as a, as a suite of services, not anyone in any isolation. The um, user journeys, this shouldn't be any surprise to anybody with an institutional repository. Basically, coming in via a home page or a search page to the service, you can then sort of navigate your way through, through browsing and searching, advanced searching and so on. And there's going to be an area for um, my records, a sort of my data finder service. And similarly, for our admin services, a similar sort of um, user journey for them. I think I should uh, mention with all of this, this is all work in progress, and so it's all planning. We haven't actually released this to the big wide world yet and tried it, so you know, things may change as we go along and test it. And looking at the status of the records as they come in, again, this has got a lot of similarities with the repository world, where the researcher creates a draft record, it comes in and it then is assigned a submitted status. At that point, it can then be reviewed by our reviewers. Um, staffing yet to be decided, but at that point, it can then have different status, or status statuses um, assigned to it, whether it's referred, whether it's been approved and goes straight to the open, um, the open catalog, whether it's been rejected out of hand because it's not relevant to Data Finder, or whether there's a query that needs to be escalated to somebody else uh, before it can be answered and then pushed either to the Open Data Finder or back to the researcher for further information. As for populating Data Finder, this is the sort of elephant in the room. And any of us who've worked with institutional repositories knows how hard it can be to get content in there. And so um, we're looking at ways of persuading researchers to make sure that items are in there by selling the benefits, the sort of create once, use many times information argument that we can put in, and also the ongoing visibility and impact that by having a record in Data Finder, not necessarily the full data, but at least a record, that people can then find your data and be able to um, then get access to it, perhaps to use it later on and build on that data. We're looking at some sort of mediated service for adding records on behalf of, um, of researchers. That could be within the libraries, it could, be, it could be within the academic departments. And as far as the interface goes, we're trying to make it a non-scary interface. So rather than having sort of bold, uh, very librarian questions, you know, making the, the name of the field highlighted um, and making that sort of the, the spot that people uh, focus on. Looking at a sort of softer questionnaire approach to make it sort of more easy to answer. And as I said before, aiming for good enough metadata that at least enables to know, us to know what we've got and that the data can be cited. And this, this is rather too long a list for my liking, but there are still a lot of very big outstanding challenges for us about obtaining rich metadata, first of all, about a culture change. This is all new for academics. We've already heard how few academics, as a matter of course, create metadata records for their uh, metadata at all for their research data. Factors like deduplication, we've heard um, Herbert Van Sample talk about um, versions this morning, and that, that comes into the practice of deduplication and how we're going to deal with that. Sustainability is a big problem. 
and also um, integration with other systems. We're already talking with um, our uh, David Shopping, who's developing the Oxford DMP online. We've identified the common fields which will, um, will automatically come from the DMP on online tool into Data Finder and Data Bank so that researchers don't have to add those twice. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Neil, who's going to go into the slightly more um, dynamic technical details. Okay, um, just going through this slide, then the overall architecture of data finder sits in, in the middle there, and it stores essentially two kinds of records. Uh, the blue records are manually created, and the green records are actually harvested from elsewhere. And depending on where we get the information from, the metadata from, then we have different ways of treating those records. Um, if somebody actually put something in data bank, um, the data archives, um, the metadata standards between data finder and data bank are aligned, so that essentially all we do is pull the metadata record into the cache log. It's already there alongside the data. Uh, one thing we haven't discussed is the data finders um, designed to be potentially part of a tiered architecture, so that a department could actually run its own data cache log and manage its own cache log, and we can harvest records into the central data cache log. Um, various other systems, like ORDS, um, when you set up a database in ORDS, it asks you various questions about who's going to pay for it, who your funder is, so that can provide us with some metadata as well to actually see the record. In this case, however, what we get from ORDS may not be sufficiently complete for us. So there is the idea that you can have a manually curated um, overlay record that takes some of the material from um, ORDS or another source, um, but you can augment it within data finder to have a computer record to have more metadata. And a similar approach is taken with some of the external sources for um, database records, the cloud, the grid, and other external repositories. And the idea is all this metadata will be pulled in by well, using OAIPMH or some other harvest protocol. In the first instance, OAIPMH is our target protocol for that. Um, we will add other plugins if it's been necessary and over time as, as things develop. Um, and up there, we also want to add that some of our departments actually have repositories of their own which they look after. Um, Oxford being Oxford, there's no way we're going to sort of tell them they can't have their repository, so we harvest records again from that source, um, but if necessary we have to create some additional metadata to actually create a full record within the economy. And then importantly at the very top there is the man purely manual process. Uh, very much that for data that is physically stored, not in an online repository. Um, that can be a lot of different things. It could be USB drives, it could be dark archives and things like that, but equally it could be specimens in jars. So the system is designed to accommodate the physical but not digital um, data that people produce. Um, you know, people like taxonomists and things like that, they, their core data is actually um, exempt class specimens of each individual species stuck in a jar or a door somewhere. Uh, but they would very much like to get that material online and accessible, so they can accommodate that. Um, so that's how we pull the records in. Underneath all sits there is basically an object store, um, which is quite Fedora-like, and that is actually stores data bank as well, and a parallel, uh, basically, silo within the object store actually stores the data finder records um, as individual objects. One of the reasons we do that is that from some of these systems, data will actually move around between the repositories. So stuff that's created in all the stuff that's created elsewhere may at some point actually be archived into data bank. At that point, actually already having the record in the data bank compliant format means we just actually need to append the actual object to the, uh, to the record there and then it's already in the archive. Um, likewise down here, you can see Oxford DMP online. Um, Oxford DMP online also stores its data management plans within the object store and that allows us to do an element of pre-filling. So when somebody comes to deposit, we can say, oh, you've already done the data management plan, so we know you've got a project funded by X, um, we know your project's called Y, so we can fill in some of those metadata fields, and then they just have to attach the file to it and provide us with another couple of bits of information. Um, at the top, very importantly, is a something called Data Reporter, which we have uh, posted on out there, um, which actually pulls lots of analytics out of Data Finder. One of the useful things is, as a central catalog for all types of data, it can actually, it provides a landing page for DOI, for pearl resolvers, for all the citations. So we can actually get to start to get citation metrics, um, access counts and other things out of that into data reporter. So those analytics which give us ideas both on access but also the amount of data where it is and that sort of thing, those profiles are useful for service planning, 
for administrative purposes and feeding back into the management process. Uh, and very much as a case of you know, one of the business, you know, key business drivers for this is to get this sort of information out there. Um, down here, we've got links into the institution repository or the research archive, so that we want two way links between the data and the paper that it supports. Uh, so, creating a link on one side should create a corresponding link on the other side. Um, and then on top of it, very much, you've got the search results for Perl Resolver and DOIs, um, which are issued for those things we can issue a DOI for. So, things we have under our control that we can actually give some guarantee um, about preservation for, then we will issue DOIs too. Um, but some of these other things up here, we can't realistically issue DOIs because we don't actually control the final repository. And that's about it for um, technical architecture. Are there any more slides? Okay, so any questions for either of us?